Okay, welcome everyone and so sorry for this uh, delay. Uh, there are always some technical issues uh, in doing this online webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Roberta Sorrentino and I'm the Global Protection Cluster Human Rights uh, Consultant. Uh, I will be your moderator today. Uh, this event is taking place in the framework of the Humanitarian Networks and Partnership Week uh, 2022, and we're happy to see that there are many people connected from different operations, many protection actors and humanitarians. Uh, the event is organized by the Human Rights Engagement Task, Task Team, which is co-chaired by UNHCR and by our colleagues, uh, Haisaya Torotic from the World Lutheran Federation and Elisa Gazzotti from Soka Gaka International. Uh, the topic of the event today is the engagement with the African human rights mechanism uh, to strengthen the protection of people affected by humanitarian crisis. We will first hear from Patrick Eba, who is the Deputy Director at the Division of International Protection of UNHCR. And then we will give the floor to our distinguished panelists. We are happy to have today Dr. Ashwani Budo, uh, Program Manager at the Center for Human Rights University of Puerto who will give us an overview of the African human rights mechanism. Uh, then we will hear from Honorable Com Commissioner Janet Salanger, Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women in Africa. Uh, we will hear then from Mr. Clement uh, Nialeto Sibule, UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Peaceful As uh, Assembly and Freedom of Association, who will give us some good practices and lessons learned on the engagement with the African human rights mechanism. Before start, starting, please allow me to share some housekeeping rules. Um, the meeting will last uh, one hour and a half. Uh, I see that you have already started introducing yourself in the chat. So for the people who just joined, please keep doing that. So we can, uh, we can, we can know who is with us today. Um, we encourage you to use the chat to share ideas, uh, reactions to the presentation by the panelists and questions. We will monitor the chat and bring back your ideas and questions to the discussion, but feel also free to raise your hand and take the floor during the question and answer section. And then um, uh, one last thing, please mute your microphone uh, throughout the whole event and be reminded that this uh, webinar is recorded. Uh, before diving into the discussion, I would like to give the floor to Patrick Eba, uh, Deputy Director at the Division of International Protection of UNHCR. Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for giving me the floor. Dear colleagues and friends, it's a true pleasure uh, to have this opportunity to join with you and to share a couple of um, reflections as we start this important uh, conversation. Colleagues and friends, uh, while the idea and the principles of human rights actually do permeate all the work of humanitarian actors, the truth is that the effective use of the language of human rights and the mechanisms of prevention, accountability, and redress that are offered by human rights remain very limited. The reason for this has been long debated, but to us at UNHCR, the very existence of this human rights engagement task team of the GPC is a clear reflection of how intertwined and complementary the work of humanitarian actors is to that of human rights stakeholders. But the fact that we do not collaborate enough between humanitarian actors and human rights actors is particularly true in the African context because our interactions are very limited. But this situation, to be honest, is actually very ironic because at its core, the human rights system in Africa was elaborated in response to major humanitarian crises. Let us remember that it was the atrocities and violations committed on its people by the brutal regime of Idi Amin in Uganda and the violations committed by Bokassa on the population of the Central African Republic that convinced governments and other stakeholders on the continent to push for the adoption in 1981 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Some 12 years earlier, the OAU 
adopted the convention governing the specific aspects of refugee problems in Africa. In response to the massive displacement that the continent witnessed in the context of the liberation struggle, as well as uh, uh, the newly independent um, um, uh, countries. The norms of the human rights system in Africa do actually offer some very specific and useful feature that can support the advocacy and effort of humanitarian actors. This includes the equal emphasis that we see in the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on both civil and political rights as well as on socioeconomic rights. This includes the absence of a derogation clause to the rights that are guaranteed under the African Charter, a matter that has been long discussed as well. But we also have in the African human rights system the existence of the sole, globe, the sole convention globally that looks at the specific issues that affect displaced persons, and that is the AU Convention for the Protection and Assistance of Internally Displaced Persons in Africa, known as the Kampala Convention. In addition to the specific features of its normative uh, content, the African human rights system that also offer a number of critical institutions and mechanisms that are relevant to the work of humanitarian actors. Some of these institutions can be extremely strategic when we are confronted with political challenges. Some of these institutions can be alternative channels that can help in seeking justice and obtaining effective remedies when national systems are compromised or inadequate. We've seen it, including recently, through the engagement of the African Commission in the Ethiopian situation. We've seen several subsidiary organs of the African Commission engage at the time of crisis across the continent. This is critical. This shows how we as humanitarian actors can better work and engage with the African human rights system. Yet, our engagement, as I said, remains limited often because we do not know well uh, the African human rights system. And this is why the webinar of today is so critical. It will allow us to better understand how the mandate of the African system operates. And we have the opportunity today to hear from three main human rights mechanisms of the African human rights system. I hope that in the course of this conversation, each one of you, regardless of the context where you work, regardless of the institutions that you represent, will be inspired uh, by the very important perspective and tools that the African human rights system, through its mechanism and through its norm, offer to all of us as humanitarian actors. Thank you very much and wishing you all a good conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick, and sorry for the delay. My, my team is very slow. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for mentioning the unique features of the African Charter and Human and People's Rights that can, uh, can support the advocacy protection cluster and the three generations of human rights that are included uh, in, in the African Charter, and also stressing that those mechanisms can provide alternative channels to seek justice. Um, I will now uh, move to our first distinguished uh, panelist, Dr. Ashwani Budo, Program Manager at the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria. Uh, Dr. Budo, could you please give us an overview of the three main human rights, uh, uh, African human rights mechanisms? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Roberta. As a disclaimer, I'm recovering from COVID, so I'm coughing a lot at the moment. Um, in case I go in one of the fits, please bear uh, with me. Um, distinguished, distinguished guests, 
and all um, participants. It is a pleasure to be here with you all um, today. So um, Roberta mentioned that the objective is to really familiarize <clears throat> ourselves with the African human rights system. So I will delve in an overview of the African human rights system. Uh, please, uh, like uh, it might be a bit too basic for those of us who work uh, in the field and interact with the human rights system on a daily basis, but please bear with me, especially for those of us who really uh, have been working more with the UN human rights system and have really interacted uh, with the African human rights system. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, my presentation will be divided into two, um, into two. I'll first talk a little bit about what the African human rights system is, look at the treaties um, and the treaty monitoring bodies. And then uh, the last slide will be uh, on how to interact. So in the instance of how to interact, you will see that um, I've, I've mentioned interacting with special mechanisms, which would include uh, working groups uh, or special rapporteurs. And uh, we have Honorable Commissioner uh, Ramatulai uh, with us who will delve into more details on how to interact with special mechanisms. So I will not um, delve into that. Um, next slide, please. So um, similar to the United Nations human rights system, which is arranged and has members of different mem uh, different countries in the world, the African human rights system is an arrangement by the African by African states, <coughs> and it is organized under those pieces of the African Union, which came uh, into being in 2002 through its Constitutive Act. Um, and it was formerly known as the Organization of African Unity um, for the Protection of Human Rights in the African Continent. So we are the youngest of the three regional human rights system. Um, the EU and the Inter-American Human Rights System were created uh, more or less uh, at the same time. So we are running a bit behind, if I can use the word. And uh, the African human rights system coexists alongside instruments and mechanisms adopted at sub-regional level uh, under those pieces of regional economic communities. So while there was the dialogue <coughs> to create the African Union for integration, there was at the same time um, through the Lume and Abuja declaration to have sub-regional organizations to ensure better economic integration at the sub-regional level. So the African Human Rights uh, the African Union rather recognizes eight um, sub-regional economic communities, but only three of them usually delve into human rights issues, which is the ECOWAS, the Economic Community of Western African States, the East African Community, and the Southern Af African Development Community. So when we talk about the African human rights system, they also form part of the African human rights system, but we won't delve into that today. Today we'll just look at the human rights mechanisms that have been created at the African Union level. Next slide, please. So um, the African human rights system basically was created by the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which was adopted in 1981. So the African Charter was inspired by an African conception of human rights, because um, as those of, uh, those of you working with the United Nations, you can see that you already have a lot of documents that you use uh, and you apply um, at the African, uh, in African countries. You have all the nine core human rights treaties um, of the UN, but this one was, uh, it, it was mostly inspired by an African concept. And um, it is, it has, for instance, it, recogni it recognizes culture in its preamble, it recognizes peoples in its preamble. And um, so this was adopted in the 1980s when the African Union was not yet, um, was not yet, how do you call it, institutionalized, but it was under those pieces of the Organization of African Unity. And now at the moment, the organization and African unity and the African Union together have adopted a range of treaties and soft laws in the forms of resolutions, general comment, guidelines and concluding observations that form the African human rights system. Next slide, please. So um, the, the African Charter um, and the African human rights system 
um, comprises of human rights treaty adopted by the African Union, it, uh, resolutions, general comments, concluding observations, jurisprudence. Um, next slide, please. So there are many regional human rights treaties. And the first one, as I mentioned, is the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Then there's an African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child which focuses on children's rights, and it has its own monitoring and implementation treaty body, which is the African <clears throat> Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. Then there's the Protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the Rights of Women in Africa that we call the Maputo Protocol, and its uh, monitoring body is the African Commission or the African Court. And then there's the African Court Protocol, which establishes an African Court on Human and People's Rights, <coughs> There's the Kampala Convention, and then the two conventions, the two protocols to the African Charter that have been adopted but which are not yet in force are the Protocol on Older Persons and the Protocol on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So at the moment, um, CSOs and the African Union are carrying out ratification campaigns um, with African states to ratify these two protocols so that they can uh, be in force. Next slide, please. So there are uh, the African Commission and the African Children's Committee have adopted many uh, general comments. This, the one in this slide, focus. Yes. The one in this, sorry, the one in this slide focuses on general comments of the African Commission. Um, the latest one was adopted um, uh, in 2020 and it was on the right to property of women during divorce and separation. Uh, but the African Children's Committee, as I mentioned, also has developed many general comments uh, concerning the rights of the child under the African Children's Charter. Next slide, please. <coughs> so there are three main human rights bodies at the African um, Union level. First, we have the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, which was established by the African Charter. Then we have the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, established by the African <coughs> Children's Charter. And we have the African Court on Human and People's Rights. So this uh, slide basically talks about when they were established, their seat, uh, sorry, what mandates they have, and what is the jurisdiction and the different functions that each of these human rights bodies are. So if, you look, if we look at the functions, we can see that for the African Commission and the African, <coughs> sorry, for the African Commission and the African Children's Committee, they engage in state reporting procedure, they handle complaints, they set standards through um, soft law, they undertake country missions, um, undertake studies, and in some instances, uh, they deal with urgent interventions. Whereas the African Court on Human and People's Rights only adjudicate, adjudicates on cases and gives advisory opinion. So it's more of a judicial uh, human rights body and it doesn't really develop soft law per se. Next slide, please. So all of the institutions have uh, 11 experts. Um, they have different qualifications that um, they require. But um, and then uh, the, the, the African Commission and the African Children's Committee have special mechanisms. So um, the, the, the African Commission, however, unlike the UN human rights system, where members of your special mechanisms do not necessarily need to be forming part of uh, a treaty monitoring body. Here at the African Commission level, all the commissioners or, and this, like all uh, members, like for instance, the special rapporteur is a commissioner of the African Commission. So it's not external persons, but persons who are within the African Commission. And that sometimes can pose a problem because of the workload that they have. Um, and uh, in terms of sessions, the African Commission has four sessions, two are public and two are private. Um, the African Children's Committee has two and the African Court has four. Next slide, please. Um, so they each, similar to uh, treaty monitoring bodies at the UN levels, they each have uh, different documents that govern 
um, the day-to-day -day running. For instance, they have rules of procedures, they have guidelines, they have practice directions, and they have different resolutions. In terms, <coughs> in terms of the nature of the decisions, the African Commission and the African Children's Committee uh, uh, committee's decisions are just recommendations, so they are not binding on African states. And the African Court issues binding judgments, but then in terms of implementation also, I think there was a study carried out by the African Court where it was found that only 7% of the African Court's decisions have been implemented. So they have uh, appointed or they're in the process of appointing someone to ensure implementation of decisions. But I think implementation <coughs> is challenging even if they are binding um, judgments. So uh, next slide, please. Concerning how to engage with the African human rights system. So firstly, uh, you can always, the, 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 the UN can always make statements during the African Commission's sessions. Secondly, um, norm development. So the general comments that are being developed by the African Commission, by the African Children's Committee, the UN can, uh, the, the different uh, organs or different uh, offices can also uh, participate in norm development. I remember um, we had, we like together with the then Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women in Africa, we were developing the general comment on child marriage. Then we also worked with uh, UNICEF Mozambique a little bit to provide us guidance um, on the general comment. So that can be um, an entry point. I think the most um, the, the, the most efficient way would be to work with special mechanisms. So I'll let uh, Commissioner Ramatulai after the presentation to talk a little bit about how to interact with her mechanism or mechanisms of the special rapporteur generally. <coughs> and then um, the, when there's the process of state reporting, um, you can also present shadow reports that raises issues with recommendations. Another issue that I did not mention um, in this, and now I'm thinking about it, um, is engagement with national human rights institutions and CSOs during the pre-session of the African Commission. So usually there's, there are many pre-sessions uh, that happen uh, before the African Commission session by NGOs, by uh, in collaboration with the African Commission, of course, because I know, for instance, <coughs> the network of national human rights institutions, and I think the OHCHO also is a developmental partner um, with that. So they, for instance, this year, before the African Commission session, they had a session on business and human rights. Um, you can also push for um, a session on migration related issues, and then they give recommendations to the African Commission. Um, and uh, as per, I think it's resolution 371, I can't remember now, the African Commission, they're supposed to work in collaboration with the African Commission, but there's also the Addis Ababa roadmap um, through which the African Union and the UN generally should work together. So it's good to look at that roadmap and see how you can um, have entry points with the different African human rights system. So this brings me to an end of the presentation. Um, thank you very much. And I hope um, you have a better idea of how to interact with the African human rights system um, going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ashwani, for this uh, detailed overview and uh, for giving us some examples of engagement and entry points for our uh, protection actors in the field on engagement with this mechanism and also for mentioning indeed um, the pre-session of the African Commission and the CSOs and NGOs forum where our protection actor can also intervene. That's very useful. Um, I would like now to pass to our second speaker, Honorable Commissioner Jeanette Ramatoui Salanger, the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women in Africa. Welcome, Commissioner, and sorry for the delay in, in getting you in. Um, uh, Commissioner Ramatuli, she is the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women in Africa and she's a, a Commissioner at the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Uh, she will explain how to work with a special mechanism and, uh, and how it can enhance the protection of people affected by humanitarian crisis, especially women who, as you all know, they are the most affected by conflict and displacement. 
Commissioner Ramatui, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. Um, honorable um, panelists, distinguished guests, participants, it is indeed my honor to take part in this very important panel and to share perspectives on the on the work of the special mechanisms of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights and how protection clusters can interact with the special mechanisms of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. With particular emphasis on my office as the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women in Africa. In terms of structure in, um, in my presentation, I'll provide an overview of the structures of the African Commission special mechanism so you have an idea of the mechanisms we have and how we work. Then I'll say a little thing about dynamics of gender in humanitarian crisis and internal displacement, just to put things in perspective, and how the protection clusters can interact with the special mechanisms and provide a few recommendations for your consideration in carrying out your work. Uh, in terms of the overview of the structure of the African Commission special mechanism, I'll start by saying that within the African human rights system, the Commission is the only EU organ that has established special mechanisms to focus on different thematic areas that are of special concern to the work of the commissions, so as to facilitate the implementation of its mandates. So the mechanisms actually help in the implementation of the mandate of the Commission and their different themes. This strategy has proved to be an excellent working tool, which also enables the Commission to have a better understanding of the human rights situations in the continent. The mandate of each of the 13 me special mechanisms, we have 13 in all, entails inter alia, undertaking research, promotion missions to countries, you go in country in situations where you have mass violations, adopting resolutions in, in deserving cases, urgent appeals to state parties when we send letters of appeal where the situations have deteriorated on, on respective thematic areas. The Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women is, is only one of the 13 mandates that operate within the African Commission. In addition to Special Rapporteurs, these mandates or special mechan mechanisms take the form of working groups and committees. And these working groups sometimes actually invite experts to take part in the work of the working groups. So we have expert members and members from the Commission. And that's another avenue of taking part in the work of the Commission because the experts are outside the Commission and they're invited. So occasionally we have a call for experts. They have a time limit and when their term expires, we, and we can order call for experts to participate. While the specific, specific, specific activities may vary, the mechanisms are structured in more or less the same way as the one on women. And their mandates are specific to a variety of thematic human rights issues. The special mechanisms also collaborate with different stakeholders in the continent and international development partners. And this is very relevant to partners in the UN system in order to carry out the specific projects on the different areas of specialization. There's also a lot of collaboration across the mandates of the mechanism on cross-cutting issues. For example, women in distress due to internal displacement would be of concern to the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women as well as a special rapporteur on refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced persons, and migrants in Africa. So there is a special mechanism at the Commission that is squarely responsible for refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced persons and migrants. So this is very important. But now I'll just now focus on the mandate of the special rapporteur on the rights of women in Africa. The mandate is to assist, assist African governments in developing and implementing national policies to promote and protect women's rights in Africa in accordance with the domestication of the Maputo Protocol and general harmonization of domestic, domestic laws with the rights enshrined in the protocol. So we help and assist member states in developing and implementing national policies in the implementation of the instruments. We also undertake, as highlighted earlier in the overview of the system, to undertake promotion and fact-finding missions to African countries, which are EU member states, with a view to popularizing AU human rights instruments and investigating the situation of women's rights in the countries visited. We also monitor the implementation by state, state parties of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights and its protocols on the rights of women in Africa, in particular by preparing reports on the situation of women in women's rights in Africa 
and proposed recommendations to be adopted by the Commission. Where necessary, we also draft resolutions on the situation of women in African countries and propose them to the members of the Commission for adoption. We conduct comparative study on the situation of women's rights in African countries. We also do establish guidelines of laws, guide, as highlighted earlier, guidelines in order to enable member states to better address issues related to women's rights in their periodic report and initial report submitted to the Commission. Since its establishment, the mandate of the Special Rapporteur has made significant strides in advancing the rights of women in Africa. And we'll deal with specific ways in which protection cl clusters can interact with the mandate in fulfilling in, in, in its, um, its responsibility and role. It is important to note, however, that women's rights cut across all the various special mechanisms of the Commission. And the mandates are all inextricably linked. They are all linked. You can't separate them sometimes. This gives an integral dimension and outlook on the mandate, and therefore, mainstreaming those cross-cutting issues in order to advance the rights of women is imperative, as it will address the economic, social, environmental, political, and other challenges faced by women in the continent. The Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women in Africa, however, remains at the forefront of the efforts to address and respond to new developments and concerns relating to women in Africa. Furthermore, the commissioners entrusted with responsibility for special mechanism are also country rapporteurs spread across the member states of the AU. So in addition to the mechanisms we have and the offices we hold, we actually designated country rapporteurs for each of the countries. The AU. Uh, this is indeed relevant for protection clusters who may want to engage on issues directly affecting a specific country. So when an issue arises in the direct of a specific country, you can interact with the country repertoire. Details of the country repertoire you can file on the website of the commission so that you see uh, which commissioner is allocated to which country. So it's another means of um, interaction with the special mechanism. I'll just focus a little bit on gender in humanitarian crisis and internal displacement. We're all aware that conflict is not a new phenomenon in Africa. However, the rise of terror groups like Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram has exacerbated conflict in a number of countries. And what is imagined in their attacks is a dual role for women, where they are weaponized as suicide bombers, for, bombers as, for example, and as specific targets and spoils of war. Thus, women, women become both agents and victims in complex situations. This particular terror group stand out in terms of their specialization of using women as instruments of terror. Research shows that in 2017, 192 women and girls account, accounted for 92% of female suicide bombers globally were deployed by Boko Haram. In addition to being weaponized as terror activities escalate, so does the number of internally displaced persons, of which women and children are disproportionately affected. While West and East Africa have been battling conflict as a major contribution to IDPs, Southern Africa has been afflicted by natural disasters, which have also given back to IDPs. Most recently, the region has had to contend with Cyclone Idea in 2019 and the flooding in the KwaZulu Natal province of South Africa. With regard to the situation of IDPs, you find that IDPs often lack basic infrastructure for survival, with most African governments struggling to cater for their needs. Inadequate food and health services disproportionately affect women who are often primary caregivers to children, the sick and the elderly. Lack of access to reproductive health care also contributes to unplanned pregnancies that are often carried to term and delivered without access to health services in these situations. Sexual exploitation of women and girls is so common characteristic of IDPs comes, often due to insecure lodgings and general deterioration of morals in a crisis. Violence against women is also increased in conflict periods and in IDP camps. Other natural disasters like drought also create humanitarian crisis that affect women, often resulting in women dying due to structural gender inequalities. UN Women report that in drought, girls are more likely to miss school as they look for water and care for families. Child marriages often increase as well in order to alleviate economic vulnerability for girls and their families. While men are likely to easily migrate for better economic prospects when natural disasters occur, this often results in abandoned families because when they leave, they abandon their families. 
women are usually not able to easily migrate because of their care responsibilities, result in crippling poverty and food insecurity. So these are some of the challenges. So bearing in mind the context in which women find themselves in humanitarian crisis and in displacement, how can protection clusters now interact with the special mechanisms of the African Commission to be able to carry out their work and to alleviate the suffering of women? I think one of the most important areas is data collection. Because data collection by protection clusters can provide a wealth of information for the special rapporteurs to make intervention. Data collected, as, uh, for example, on the part of women can inform interventions like carrying out fact-finding mission if they are gross and systematic violation. A fact-finding mission will then include investigation into the situation, engaging with all relevant stakeholders and making recommendations for government to eliminate violation. The special report can also draft resolution for adoption by the commission in such situations based on information provided by uh, protection clusters. And in terms of uh, fact-finding uh, missions, I can just cite a few examples that have been um, embarked on by the commission in the past. Uh, worthy of note is the one in Mali, the one that was launched to Saudi Arab Democratic Republic, and the current ongoing commission of inquiry in the Tigray report, uh, region of Ethiopia. Um, in 2013, the mission was undertaken by a delegation of the commission comprised of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, Special Rapporteur on Refugees, Asylum Seekers, Internally Displaced Persons, and Migrants in Africa, and the Chairperson of the HIV Committee. During the mission, the delegation visited the Accommodation Center for the Association of Progress and Defense on the Rights of Malian Women, where it met with women, victims of conflict in Northern Mali. The delegation observed that rape and gender-based violence was a major issue in the main cities of Goa, Timbuktu, and Kaida. These are all feedback that we get when we engage um, on promotion um, and fact-finding missions. In September 2012 also, at the request of the Executive Council of the AU, and at the invitation of the government of the Sarawi Arab Democratic Republic, the Commission also undertook a fact-finding mission to that country. And the mission was taken within the framework of the protective mandate of the Commission to investigate human rights violations in the occupied territories and the liberated territories and refugee camps of the Sahrawi Arab, Arab Democratic Republic, especially as this pertain to the right to self-determination of the Sahrawi people. The Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women was part of the mission together with special mechanism of the commission. Um, furthermore, with regard to the, risk, the, the ongoing situation in Ethiopia, the commission was seized by Hechi Musa Faki Mohammed, chairperson of the African Commission, following a meeting of the AU Peace and Security Council held on 9th May 2021, in which the Prime Minister of the Federal Republic of Ethiopia, H e, uh, His Excellency Dr. Abdi Ahmed, expressed the will to engage the Commission in undertaking investigation on the ongoing crisis in the Tigray region of Ethiopia. The Commission welcomed this commendable initiative to investigate the ongoing crisis in Tigray region, and in this regard, on 22nd March, requested the government's authorization to undertake a fact-finding mission to Ethiopia. However, following extensive consultation, the Commission finally decided during its 32nd extraordinary session to establish a commission of inquiry into the human rights situation in the Tigray, that is based on Resolution 482. In Cairo, in its mission, the Commission organized various meetings with different actors, including Ethiopian authorities. In addition, it held oral hearings to receive testimonies of witnesses and victims, and also receive reports on the human rights situation in the Tigray region. This Commission of Enquiry is still ongoing, it's still pending and ongoing, and the final report of the Commission of Enquiry will be submitted to the AU policy organs for adoption and will also be published in due course for you know, consumption of general public. With regard to, regarding other contributions of protection, protection clusters, they can also contribute to the drafting of shadow reports, as alluded to previously, on the situation of women and girls in their jurisdictions. This will assist the special mechanisms to constructively put questions to state parties in the construction of state reports under Article 62 of the African Charter and Article 26 of the Maputo Protocol. This will help to inform recommendations on how best the state can protect the rights of women and girls who are IDPs or who are in a humanitarian crisis. I think the state reporting process, as alluded to when we're dealing with the overview of the African system, is a very important tool. 
And but what is important is that because it provides a very unique um, opportunity to state parties to report on legislative and other measures taken to implement rights as well as success registered challenges encountered in the implementation and domestication of instruments. It also encourages constructive engagement with the Commission, thereby making it a useful tool in monitoring human rights situation in state parties. The Commission has also opened up to state reporting exercise to members of civil society by receiving shadow reports prepared by accredited NGOs and NHRIs, national human rights institutions. And these shadow reports will normally be taken into consideration when considering the reports of states. And it will also give us the opportunity to ask questions and also in the recommendations and conclude observations to be taken into consideration. So any feedback we get regarding shadow reports or information we receive, we take it into consideration when we're considering state reports. So it might be useful to look at the agenda of the commission and to find out which particular country will be submitting its report or deliberating on its report and to provide relevant information to guide the commission in carrying out its rules and responsibility. It is also worth noting that the Office of the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women, the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, and the Focal Point on Reprisals in Africa, and the Special Rapporteur on Refugees, Asylum Seekers, inter Internal Displaced Persons, and Migrants in Africa, in collaboration with, with our long-standing partner at the Center for Human Rights, the University of Pretoria, we are currently developing a shadow reporting guidelines to facilitate the drafting of such reports by stakeholders. So these guidelines should be able to should be of interest, at least to first, first, um, assist in you know following the procedure and the format for um, shadow reports. So this is something that we're working on, and hopefully it should be made available very um, very soon. Also, the Office of the Special Rapporteur is also available to engage the protection clusters and other relevant stakeholders in elaborating human rights protection obligation by state parties in the African human rights system. The mandate may be invited to popularize provisions of the Maputo Protocol that are relevant to women in crisis and assist governments on dev devising strategies to implement them. For example, Article 11 of the Maputo Protocol is dedicated to women in armed conflict with the perpetration of violence, rape, or any sexual exploitation against IDP women been considered war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. So we can partner with agencies and protection clusters to popularize and to raise awareness as a preventive measure, as opposed to um, you know, reacting when situations arise. Also, where protection clusters record systematic or gross violations of women's rights in humanitarian crisis, they can also explore filing communications that is complex with the commission which will be considered by the Commission sitting as a whole. This will be very important. Then the Commission will review the complaints and then um, make recommendations for affected populations. The special mechanisms also prepare audience letters of appeal in deserving cases when you have gross violations. So if it is brought to our attention, an audience letter of appeal will, will be prepared. Press statements are also part of the working modalities of the special mechanisms, including that of the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women. So therefore, it's important for protection clusters to report violations to the mechanisms, including the special repertoire, which can be addressed to urgent letters of appeal followed by press statements for public um, consumption. So these are various ways of you know, interacting with the various mechanisms uh, of the African Commission. I'll just offer a few specific recommendations which we should take into consideration. Um, and these are one, protect, protection clusters are encouraged to look beyond humanitarian needs of their beneficiaries. You have to go beyond the needs of the beneficiary, but to use instruments like the Maputo Protocol to identify violations of women's human rights. So whilst you're meeting the immediate needs, you should actually adopt a human rights based approach and make sure that you identify a violation of women's human rights. After identifying violations, incorporate human rights standards in order to assist in eliminating discrimination, for example, in the supply of aid. Protection clusters are also encouraged to form collaborations, alliances with human rights organizations, in order to offer holistic assistance to IDPs uh, and women in humanitarian crisis. Uh, on between Indonesia uh, uh, and the representative uh, from so the special rapporteur to brainstorm on ways to increase the protection of human rights of women in crisis in accordance with the Maputo Protocol and other instruments. And finally, 
the Office of the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women is always open to everyone individually or collectively in pursuing the improvement of the rights of women in Africa. So whenever you want to collaborate, you need to bring anything to our attention, we're always open and we're happy to receive and then to facilitate. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Ramatuli, for this uh, very uh, inspiring presentation and for the recommendations. Um, first of all, to mentioning how women's rights is a cross-cutting issues and how several mechanisms, not just yours, actually can, can deal with the situation of, of women in conflict uh, situations. And also for mentioning uh, concrete examples of cooperation and support that the protection cluster can provide. This is very important because, as you know, protection cluster members, they, they gather lots of information and, and they can inform your mechanism and they can guide intervention. Um, before uh, moving to the next panelist, I just want to drop two questions that perhaps uh, you can you can answer to uh, before uh, doing the question and answer. First of all, uh, you mentioned the fact finding missions. And I was wondering for protection cluster to share information on a specific country situation. How do they get in touch with 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 the commissioner that are part of the fact finding mission through the country rapporteur that you mentioned? Or if there is a more straightforward way, there is, for instance, a call for submissions that is issued before the fact finding missions and protection cl cluster can provide information through that call for submission. If you can in the question and answer section, if you can clarify that and um, yeah, that's actually for the moment the only question I have just to feel more practically how what we can uh, suggest to protection cluster and, and ways they can interact with you more concretely. Thank you so much again, Commissioner Ramatuli, for this uh, very interesting presentation. And now I would like to pass to uh, Mr. Clement Nezalo Sivule, UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Peaceful Assembly and Freedom of Association. Um, Special Rapporteur, you will speak about good practices and, and lessons learned. You have a long standing experience working with the African can make it, so I'm sure you can share some good examples of cooperation that can inspire our operations and actors in the field. The floor is yours. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Maria. Honorable Commissioner Janet, dear colleagues, let me first thank uh, UNISA Global Protection Cluster and my dear friend Patrick Eba and his team for organizing this event and inviting me to speak. I commend UNISA tireless efforts to connect closer the international and regional human rights mechanism with the laudable work of its staff on the ground in the humanitarian field. Having listened to how the African human rights mechanism work, and mindful that many of you are familiar with how the international human rights mechanism work, I would like to start my intervention by reminding you that you should also consider engaging with both sets of mechanisms, international and regional, and also encourage them to work together in support of your work. And I will provide you a very practical example here. The system of UN Special Procedure has a long history of connecting and cooperating with the regional human rights system. Initially, this cooperation used to be rather ad hoc at the initiative of individual mandate holders. However, over the years, this cooperation has become more institutionalized. The first example of this is what we call the Addis Ababa Roadmap, which is the framework guiding the cooperation between the UN Special Procedure and the Special Mechanism at the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. This roadmap was agreed by the two system in 2012. And exactly this year, we have started celebrating its 10th anniversary. So I'm doubly honored to be at this event as a, as a way to commemorate once more this important anniversary. The roadmap, or the Addis Ababa roadmap, has often been quoted in many different fora as one of the success stories a blueprint of cooperation between the international and regional human rights system. Over these 10 years, this framework has provided the stimulus for a number of joint action and collaborative work, ranging from a big number of joint statements and press releases 
for the most part on thematic issue, but some also on specific situation and countries of concern. Example of the abduction of the Chibok, Chibok girls. Collaborative thematic work has also been very successful in the framework of the Addis Ababa roadmap. Here, the most illustrative example is what the later Christoph Hens, as a former UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitral Execution, and African Commission Working Group on the Death Penalty and Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitral Killing achieved. First, they aligned their mandate to work in partnership to improve human rights protection on the right to life in Africa, and ultimately at the international level. This alignment gave more scope for joint projects and an opportunity for collaboration in various fora at the technical level. Secondly, following the working group initial, initial proposal for a draft protocol to abolish the death penalty in Africa, the UN Special Rapporteur and the working group prepared a draft text which was subsequently submitted to the political organ in Addis Ababa. At the same time, the working group and the UN Special Rapporteur worked together on a general comment to the African Charter on the Right to Life, which was eventually adopted by the African Commission during its 57th session. This general comment was the pioneer as the UN Human Rights Committee followed suit with a general comment on the right to life, which draw heavily on the regional one. This shows that there is value in the two system joining hand for advancing the interpretation of the international and regional human rights norms and standards. Another example of the form that cooperation between the two systems may take is that of joint visit conducted in Tunisia in September 2012 by UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, Margaret Segagia, and the then Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, Renala Pinigansu. It was the first visit to North of Africa by human rights experts since the Arab Spring. The joint visit was an opportunity to speak with one voice on issue of freedom of expression, association, and human rights defenders. And the final very concrete example of, of cooperation I would like to bring to your attention is on the joint work around law reform, and more specifically, the collective advocacy efforts of the, of the then Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, Michel Foss, together with the then Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders of the African Commission, Rena Lapinigansu, for the enactment of a national law on the promotion and protection of human rights defenders in Cote d'Ivoire, which was eventually adopted in 2014, making Cote d'Ivoire the first African state with such a law and one of few in the world. The law has since inspired other governments and civil society coalition and two countries, Burkina Faso and Mali, have passed their own law on the rights to human rights defenders. And there are still many other countries like Niger and Togo who are in the same process. This is a just few examples, but there are other which in the interest of time I would not develop, including the advocacy work conducted by the UN Special Rapporteur on IDP in conjunction with the African Commission Special Rapporteur on Refugee Background and IDPs regarding the Kampala Convention and the collaboration of the two systems initiated around discrimination and violence against LGBTI. Let me also mention that although this important work done within the Addis Ababa from, uh, framework, one important area identified by the roadmap is still not properly addressed by the two mechanisms. In fact, the roadmap envisages the possibility for both mechanisms to contribute to early warning by providing input to the UN and the AU peace and security machinery. This is an area where UNHCR can bring his expertise to the two systems at the, at the time when we are seeing the increase of refugee crisis around the world due to the human rights crisis. I hope these examples have illustrated beyond doubt 
the value of cooperation, especially across mechanisms, geography, and culture, and how the roadmap has helped to reveal the reality of the universality and interdependence of human rights. And I hope that you will be even more motivated after today's events to engage vigorously with both systems as we embark on the next decade of the Addis Ababa roadmap implementation. I would like to stop there and ready or to answer any question you may have. Thank you very much for your attention and thanks for the invitation. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Wule. This is the perfect conclusion of this uh, presentation, stressing how the two systems, international human rights system and the regional human rights system, can complement and reinforce each other. I think this is a very powerful message that, that you gave. And also, thank you for bringing more examples of a successful cooperation with the mechanism. This is also very important. Um, so now I would like to open the question and answer section. I see that there is already uh, there are two questions already for Commissioner Ramatuli, which will add to the question I had uh, I had asked previously. And I also encourage all the other uh, participants to ask questions, really to to use this crucial opportunity to ask questions regarding the functioning of the mechanism, better way to interact with them, because it doesn't happen very often that we can have these experts with us together. So I would really uh, stress the importance of engaging with them. So uh, let's start the question and answer. Um, Commissioner Ramatuli, if you want to reply already to the questions that were asked, um, and then we will wait to receive other questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Maria. I think with regard to the question that you asked regarding the, the, the practicality of how to approach the mechanism, whether to go to the uh, mechanisms or to go to the um, country repertoire. I think what is important is that, I mean, uh, once the information is available, uh, any interested party or protection cluster can approach the Secretariat of the African Commission to request for a dialogue with either the country repertoire or the chair of the mechanism because every you, you either have a, you are either a, a special rapporteur or you are at the chair of a, of a particular mechanism so once that request is made they will be contacted directly either to the mechanism itself that, that is the chair of the mechanism or if you are a special rapporteur to the office of special rapporteur to ensure that there will be dialogue so through that dialogue you can schedule a meeting information can be shared and that actually can actually lead if in, in deserving cases to a fact finding mission being filled in, because depend on the the, 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 the the veracity of the information that is received, because sometimes we need to actually make sure that we have credible information. We can also rely on rumors or just publications in the press. So once the information is available, that can actually trigger that. But what is important is that whether you come to a mechanism or you come to the um, special repertoire, if an information is sent to a country repertoire, and that particular information is relevant to a thematic area, the mechanism will be involved. Also, if an information is channeled through uh, the mechanism, for example, a working group, invariably, if it affects a particular country, the working group will involve the country repertoire. So it's, it's checks and balance. We make sure that we all work together and we coordinate. So the mechanism will not work on something that, on a, with regard to a particular country, that the country repertoire will not be aware of. In the same vein, also, if the country repertoire is approached and the information is relevant to a particular thematic area, it will, it will be prudent for the country repertoire to reach out to the, to, the, to the working group responsible for that so that there is co coordination and we don't work in silos. So we have an integrated approach. So I think, I hope that answers your question, Maria. <laughs> Maria, is that okay? Thank you. Yes, okay. sorry. Did I, I see a question thank on, you. The, on the dial? Yes, yes, you yes thank you. A question or that's okay? Thank you, Commissioner Ramatuli. Yes, it just takes a bit for to unmute myself. There are also two other questions that were asked in the chat that I'm going to read them out loud for you, Commissioner Ramatuli. Uh, the first is, uh, could, could you comment on the knowledge gaps on human rights be it in the general population and potential actors in promotion and protection. So this question is about the knowledge gaps on human rights in uh, in promotion and protection. 
And what is the role of property and lack of education in vulnerability to human rights abuses? What are the measures in place to address these factors? Okay, I think um, during my presentation, I did um, make reference to the state reporting obligation. Because through the state reporting process, member states can be held accountable to the, to the, to the legislative policy and institutional framework within the context of their countries in terms of uh, implementation of the specific um, uh, obligations enshrined in the charter and the various protocols within the African human rights mechanisms. So I think what is important is when, when, when the information is brought out, we're able to dialogue with the state. We actually interrogate the state with regard to, in fact, what is related to civil society engagement, knowledge, 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 knowledge awareness, and all the gaps that are that are relevant. And the state specific recommendations will be made to the state because we have to be mindful of the fact that the commission, as highlighted earlier, when we're talking about the overview of the human rights um, system, can only make recommendation to the state. It cannot descend into arena and take the responsibility of the state or the role of the state. So the, the state has a responsibility to raise awareness of the citizenry. Um, but when there is a gap, when is a gap, we are in a position to make recommendation to the state to fill the gap. Another mechanism we have in place is we, sometimes we en embark on national dialogue on specific issues. The essence of the national dialogue really is to raise awareness so that when we have studies that, and reports by the commission, we embark on a national dialogue to raise awareness within population and actors on the contents of the documents, if there are guidelines, if there are reports, if there are studies, we have embark on national dialogue to raise awareness within the population. And in, the, in, that, in those instances, we, we ensure that we have a cross-section of society, including the media, and the whole idea of having the media is for it to be replicated. Because if you raise the awareness of the media, the expectation is that the media will pass the world around and all stakeholders within the country. We also embark on training seminars, continental uh, conferences, just to make sure that we have a critical mass of people. But what we can do is we cannot get everybody, we cannot get the entire population. So what we do is we raise a critical mass and we're hoping that the information will be disseminated by people who are uh, who are attending some of these functions that we, we embark on. So this is how we go about it as a commission. But I want to reinforce the fact that the responsibility of the commission is not to descend into the arena and take the role of the state. What we can do if information is brought to the action of the commission, we're able to make the relevant recommendation to the state to take action with regard to the gaps and the requirements. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Commissioner Ramatuli. Um, I don't know if there is anyone among our participants that want to take the floor or wants to ask another question. Otherwise, I have a question for uh, Mr. Bule. Perhaps I will just go ahead. Uh, Mr. Wule, you stressed the, um, the important work, I mean, what is already stated in the roadmap, in the Addis Ababa roadmap, on the importance to work on early warning. And you stressed the, the importance of UNHCR, the support that UNHCR can provide in early warning. Can you elaborate a bit more on what UNHCR and the UNHCR-led protection cluster can, can do to support the, like, the work of in, on early warning and therefore the prevention of, uh, of human rights violations. If you can work more on that, of course, it would be much more useful instead of intervening always after, always once the violations have occurred. So I think uh, at, at the system level, we, we always try to work more on early warning, but I wonder if you have more um, concrete examples on how UNCR and the protection cluster can support that work. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Maria. And as I mentioned, this is an area where the Addis Ababa roadmap uh, clearly points as possibility for the both systems to cooperate. Why? Because um, the two systems uh, are composed by the rapporteur, by uh, independent experts that are uh, tasked to really um, um, bring to their mechanism uh, information that uh, the trends and the information that are needed to evaluate the situation or the possible deterioration of situation of human rights in one particular country. And as we are, uh, uh, we, I'm, I'm sure we agree that today, uh, if we look at many crises, refugees crises around the world, uh, all of those crises are due to the, to the lack of uh, protection of human rights on the ground, 
the emergence of authoritarian regime. And we and those mechanisms are also mechanisms that work closely with this country. And I think one of the um, area where we haven't been able to really work jointly is in particular this area in uh, raising or uh, 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 being able to, to, to kind of raise this early warning sign in terms of violation. Yes, since Addis Ababa roadmap, uh, we saw that um, the African Commission rapporteur and experts are becoming more involved in the commission of inquiry set up by the UN to the, the case of uh, Burundi. But then it's important for us in, a, in, in, in a, at the system level how we jointly within this roadmap we can share information that are critical information to warn the international system, to warn African uh, AU peace and security about the possible deterioration of human rights in one country that will lead to the gross human rights violation as we are seeing in, across the continent. And what, one thing that is impossible, in, and I think UNHCR can do, because you have also very uh, powerful communication tools. You have also entrance to the states. You can also be able also to help us whenever we raise those issues through your evaluation, through your office on the ground that can provide us with concrete evidence that we can also use, like during the review of the African Commission, African Commission can use it and alert the international community that this is going to happen if we don't take any step, concrete step. Also, we can also use it during our presentation of the report at the Human Rights Council also too. But we need those concrete uh, signs, those concrete evidence coming from the ground in order to convince states and to convince other states that will take a decision or will adopt the resolution. And I think by doing that, it will also help both systems to set up a, a, an effective warning, warning system that can also, uh, that, that will help both systems to support the, the, the peace and security issue around the, 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 the world. Thank you, Mr. Wule, for, for specifying how we can support in this endeavor. I see that there is a yeah. Benedict who raised their hand. Yeah, I, I know uh, yes, that please. there's been a rectification in the chat because I didn't quite understand the question, the role of poverty. But I think it's been very clear. The role yeah, of it was the role of poverty. And the lack of education. Yes. 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 I, I, I think I'd like to speak to that a little bit because you find out that uh, with the mechanisms we have at the level of the commission, sometimes you need the necessary resources to be able to approach the commission. And if you don't have the necessary resources, it will be difficult. And sometimes even the know-how to know that there's been violations. So in a situation of that nature, at the, at the, at the national level, this is where the NGOs and the national human rights institutions come in. Because it's the role of national human rights institutions at the, at, the, at the national level to raise awareness of the population and where there are mass violations of human rights to bring it up and to, 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 and to redress and uh, make recommendations to the states. NGOs also, you find that invariably most of the communications and complaints that come to the commission are presented by NGOs on behalf of communities, people who, who cannot afford to operate the commission and people who may not even be aware that there has been violation. So this is where the NGOs and the National Human Rights Commission can play a very pivotal role in bringing to the attention of the commission the human rights situations in their countries, irrespective of whether people are aware and the poverty in other, other level of countries. I think that's a very good question and that uh, I thought I should respond to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, I think there is Benedict who would like to take the floor, perhaps, and then there is another question in the chat. Benedict, you can, you can, the floor is yours. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I don't know, perhaps uh, uh, from uh, the Commissioner and Special Rapporteur, or one of those. Um, it's a question regarding uh, decision uh, taken by uh, the Banjul Commission, but it could also apply for decision taken by the African Committee of Experts on the Right and Welfare of the Child. It has been emphasized to us that it's those decisions following uh, the lodging of an individual complaint or a communication, whether by an individual or an NGO or, or potentially a, another institution. Um, I know they don't have, uh, they're not legally binding the decision uh, released by, uh, by uh, the treaty body, but <clears throat> We have seen in practice that there has been uh, some time, especially with uh, decision, for instance, from the African Committee of Experts on, on the right and welfare of the child, there has been some mechanism 
to follow up the implementation of the recommendation of those decisions. Um, so um, I, I wanted to ask that questions because uh, you there was also in the in the first presentation there was also a statement saying that even if if a ruling from the African Court of Human and People's Rights are legally binding, in practice the level of implementation by states is extremely limited. So I mean my questions in summary is. In terms of, of strategy, when there is a human right violation, isn't it better for, for kind of advocacy purposes and, and trying also to, to have um, to keep on, on a sort of a, uh, not too strong mechanism to, to use the, 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 the possibility for complaint or communication to be triggered? Uh, and, and my other sub question was also related to the fact that the Banjul Commission has also the possibility to petition the African court in case of uh, human rights. I, I'm not very sure to know if, if it, I mean, I don't know actually if it has happened in the past, but I mean, those are the two questions I, I wanted to ask. So I don't know who wants to take the floor to to respond. To that maybe. Uh, maybe if I can start with the last part, the first question that you had when you summarized it about whether advocacy might not be the better way than using the forceful way. I would say definitely uh, because you need a bottom up approach to human rights issues. Um, we, of course, we've had uh, implementation hearings by the African Court, by the African Children's Committee to try and see what is happening with different decisions. But if a state does not have the political will to have it implemented, it will be very difficult. So at the same time, for instance, let's say there's a court case, or even if there's no case before the African human rights bodies, it might be good to start advocating, to start having uh, sensitization campaigns and to, to start having dialogues with state. Um, but sometimes if you bring a case against the state, it shakes them up and makes them realize, oh, that's a problem. Um, I, I worked on the Talibe case uh, at the African Children's Committee level um, and the first hearing that we had was actually so nice and fruitful because we had government representatives then wanting to have dialogue to try and understand how they can make the problem go away. So it was more of a, it was not as a punitive sort of um, hearing, but it was a more constructive dialogue. I, I was there, I tried to understand how it was working. They were actually trying to understand how they can make it better for the children. So I think if the state has a good will, it will definitely work out. But you cannot force states to do things like we can see with the Sarah case, which has not been implemented till now, and that was decided so long ago. But I will leave it to the experts. Yeah. <laughs> I think you've raised a very pertinent issue in terms, in terms of political will. I think that's the, that's the <laughs> as they said, the Americans said that's the bottom line. I think without a political will, whether you have a binding judgment, as we know in international law, even if you have a judgment of an international court, you can, we don't have policemen going on the ground, just like you have in national con context where you have the sheriff coming in to execute the judgment. There, it, it, it relies really on the political will of the of the state to to whether it's a recommendation or binding judgment to comply and implement the judgment. I think at the level of the African Commission, when we have a recommendation to the state, what we actually do is we give them a timeline between to report back to the commission with regard to uh, implementation. So in some instances they do report back, and in some instances, depending on the political will, they wouldn't report back. Another mechanism we use if we don't hear from the state is when they, they when we, through the state reporting mechanism, we always refer back to un, uh, unimplemented decisions of the commission and we question the state on why that has not been done. But ultimately, as you rightly observed, it's the political will that is important. And also to reinforce the fact that, yes, I do agree that um, raising awareness is very important because that is more of preventive. So that at least before you even get to coming to the commission or the court or the, the awareness of the state, because 
most of the cases that come to the court, uh, the, the commission or the committee, they relate to lack of implementation. Because if the state is implementing its obligations under this instrument, then there won't be a need uh, to come to court. But coming to the court or coming to the commission, you find that invariably it's always the last resort. Because for, at the level of the commission, we have the requirement for exhaustion of local remedies. You do all you can within the national context, and it doesn't work. That's when you approach uh, the commission. With, uh, of course, with the rules and guidelines that regulate that in terms of when it's unduly prolonged. And Bear in mind that, yes, it's important. Uh, awareness raises diplomacy. But in most cases, by the time it gets to the court, the commission, it's gone to the stage where diplomacy and negotiation may have failed. Yeah. But an another thing that uh, uh, mechanisms actually approach uh, and adopt these days is uh, ADR, <laughs> the possibility of engaging the state and the victims to the possibility. It's not always taken, but it's also a mechanism to find a look at the possibility of engaging both parties. Of course, so subject to uh, consensus and agreement of the complainant or the uh, or of the co or communication. So these are some of the mechanisms that can be adopted to address situations. But do, I do agree with you that implementation is always a problem. Mm. I don't know if uh, 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 Mr. Bule he wants to yeah. com complete. Yes, can I? Yeah. Let me add, Please add go in, ahead. Uh, my two predecessors already, um, I mean, pointed out some of the things that I am planning to say. Uh, I think we need to combine all of these strategies. And uh, I will say that um, the advocacy will not only be based on the cases or the violation, but it has to be based on the decision on how do you prove that state violates his, his obligation. And it's from there that civil society will be the advocacy. And I don't think, you know, we, we have this kind of repartition of tasks. The experts are there really to really analyze state's obligation in light of violation and issue decision. And we know that civil society is, is, is empowered to do the advocacy work. It's true, the experts can have what we call um, strategy of cooperating with the state and try also to, 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 to encourage the state to move forward in implementation. But I, I, I think it's not um, the primary work of the system will be really to, to ensure that um, whenever violation is reported, we take decision in light of the, uh, the obligation of the state but also states have the obligation, even if those, those are recommendations, it's clear under all the treaty states have obligation to implement or to fulfill his, his, his commitment under the international norm. Today, the, the, I think the main challenge we are facing, as you mentioned, uh, uh, um, as you mentioned is the, the state will to implement some of these recommendations. And we have to continue to work towards really making sure that civil society on the ground Citizens on the ground are aware. One of the things I remember when uh, the African Commission celebrated uh, his 20th anniversary was how many Africans know about the existence of charter and their rights. That's the problem. Yeah. You know, if you don't know that, then it's quite difficult even to know about decisions that are taken. So how do we make sure decisions reach at the, na the national level, including journalists, the political leader, so everybody is aware about what those experts are recommending to state to take as a, uh, as a measure. And I think uh, this is also an important element. Uh, just in summer, even in the in Addis Ababa roadmap, we also identify this area as an important area for collaboration. Because what we realize also is that many states play between the regional system, their review at the regional system, and their review at the international system and looking at this as two separate things. But we expect, we are saying that human rights violation is human rights violation. We need to cooperate. We need to, 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 we need to have one voice. We need to have one way to analyze the situation it, to ensure that whatever commission is saying to the, Africa, uh, to the state under review, we are also saying the same thing in light of the violation that we receive. You know? So then the states do not have any Kind of maneuver to really manipulate between the two systems, but they will know that our regional system say the same, international system they say the thing. We are obliged to implement these recommendations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Wule. There is a, a last question, and perhaps perhaps I can ask Ashwani 
uh, to share where a practitioner can find uh, the jurisprudence and general comments because Anne, she's asking uh, if uh, whether there is a developed jurisprudence or general comment touching upon alternatives to detention for migrants. Perhaps uh, you could share uh, the link of the website where uh, we can find general comments and um, and, and jurisprudence. And of course, if you know about the existence of these uh, um, uh, these, these guide alternatives to detention, minds, of course, uh, feel free to share it already with us. I don't know if you can hear me well. Can you hear me? OK, perfect. So as as soon as I saw the question, I actually went on the website to see if there's uh, any soft law on the issue. But the only thing that I saw is that at the moment, there is a draft protocol to the African Charter on the specific aspects of right to nationality and eradication of statelessness. But I haven't seen any general comment. Um, there must be resolutions, but I think there's a need for further digging in. So I'll just uh, copy paste the link here. I unfortunately am not aware if there's any. Yeah. Yeah, I am yeah. saying that probably there is there is no jurisprudence developed on that. Well, uh, so if there are no further questions, perhaps we can uh, wrap up. Um, colleagues, as uh, Patrick Heber was saying at the beginning, one of the barriers of engagement with the uh, with the African human rights mechanism is the lack of knowledge. Sometimes we don't know that they are there. They don't, we don't know what they do exactly. So we hope that uh, through these um, uh, webinar, uh, we uh, we have all learned a bit more about the African human rights mechanism and ways to engage with them. And um, and also just to mention the human rights engagement task team has just developed an overview, a very brief overview on the African human rights mechanism, both in English and French. And I will be happy to share it with you all if you're interested uh, to increase the knowledge and awareness on what these mechanisms can do and the um, and, and the additional channels they can provide to strengthen the protection of people in need, which is the focus of all our work in the field. And then some key messages that I think are very important. Uh, use a more human rights based approach. This is something that we've been advocating for a long time. This is what the call to action for human rights, the United Nations Secretary General call to action for human rights is asking. All UN agencies, secretariat, we should all use a more, a more, a more human rights based approach in our analysis, especially to prevent those violations from occurring. Create partnerships. I think this is also key and this is something that the protection cluster, our, our colleagues in the field can definitely do. Create partnership with human rights actors. Uh, conduct joint analysis with human rights actors and using this mechanism really not just to to have an additional work, but actually to simplify the work of, of, of our colleagues in the field. And then uh, the various um, opportunities of engagement. It was mentioned support doing the fact finding missions. Uh, the support uh, like providing information for shadow reports, uh, submitting information through the individual complaint procedure. And also I would stress uh, advocating for the implementation of the recommendation of this mechanism, because this is also something that our actors in the field can do. And this is a very easy uh, way to, to uh, work more on human rights issues, to remind governments of their obligations and, and their recommendations that are stemming from this mechanism. And um, so I think we, we gather some very important key messages. We have all learned a lot. We have all learned something new. So I would like to thank you all for uh, your active uh, participation and engagement, and especially our distinguished panelists. Uh, it was uh, really a honor to have you here with us today, to hear from you, to learn from you. Uh, so uh, I would like now to close the meeting. Thank you so much for participating thank and you. have a good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. God bless.